Hello, I'm Roy, and this is my presentation on the father of eugenics, Sir Francis Galton and hereditary intelligence. Now, our textbook calls Francis Galton a jack-of-all-trades, and that's a really apt description for him because the man did a lot of different things in his life, not to mention grow some really super impressive sideburns. He was a famous African explorer and published a few books on the subject that were quite successful. He developed the first weather maps, and if you look at the date, notice this is 1861. The amount of work that would have to go in to cover the continent of Europe uh, was pretty astonishing. He demonstrated that every person had a unique fingerprint. But know this, everything Francis Galton did paled in comparison to what his half-cousin unleashed on the world. Yes, Francis Galton and Charles Darwin were half-cousins. They shared a grandfather, in fact, who was a pretty famous guy in his own right. He was a very well-known doctor at the time. Now, it was Darwin's theory of evolution that had a very profound effect on Galton and was really the catalyst that sparked an idea that he would forever be tied to. It was not an uncommon belief at the time, especially among the elite group of upper-class peers that Galton associated with, that intelligence was an inherited trait. Once this belief was viewed through the lens of natural selection, Galton felt it was easy to see the ramifications that nature had on the human race. At the time when Galton wrote Hereditary Genius, there were no mental tests that had been developed that could accurately measure intelligence. So what Galton did instead was he began to pour through biographical dictionaries. These were books which listed people who had achieved success in their particular field. Now, Galton would take the biographical dictionaries and he would cross-reference it with population data. This gave him what he called the rate of eminence. And he figured out that about 1 in 4,000 people uh, rose to the top of intellectual society, so to speak and were successful at what their chosen field was. Now, as he got a closer look at these biographical dictionaries, he noticed that about 10% of the people had a family member um, who was also in a biographical dictionary. Uh, it's not hard to see that this ratio is much higher than, of 10% is much higher than 1 in 4,000. So following that reason, smart families had a much higher rate of eminence than the rest of the population. Unfortunately, this was just the beginning of Galton completely ignoring the vital role that environment can and does play in situations such as this. The thought that the wealth and class status that these people in these biographical dictionaries had uh, afforded them the time and the opportunity to study at the best schools seemed to be an unimportant factor to Galton. In fact, he argued that environmental factors were irrelevant and that an enriched environment could not overcome limited in natural ability. I have a quote. Opportunity is more widely spread in America than with us, and the education of their middle and lower classes far more advanced. But for all that, America certainly does not beat us in world-class works of literature, philosophy, or art. Looking at this quote, it's very easy to see the subjective point of view that Galton had. He took everything that a country did in these three areas and completely dismissed it because he basically disagreed with it. Please allow me a moment to defend Francis Galton. I understand it may not be easy after reading that last quote, but I don't want to be too harsh on the man. I think it would be easy to criticize him for his narrow-mindedness and say that he was only interested in finding evidence to support his hypothesis. But I'm afraid that might be a little bit of presentist thinking. 
it's important to understand what was going on in the community, scientific community in the 19th century. Charles Darwin had just released his theory of evolution, and Galton was a believer in it, even setting aside the family tie that those two had together. Um, I can totally relate and see how easy it would be for Galton to get caught up in the idea of evolution taking place uh, with human intelligence and that it being a completely inherited factor. Darwin actually applauded his cousin's work, but not everyone was satisfied with Galton's findings. This handsome-looking devil is Alphonse de Candal, and he noticed Galton's unwillingness to look at the importance of environmental factors on intelligence. So Candal launched his own study and found that many environmental factors actually did play a role. He especially found that countries with more academic freedom and a higher standard of living produced more intellectuals. And that stands to reason. Countries that actually have more colleges and people can actually afford to go to college would naturally produce more intellectuals in a country uh, where education was not a priority. Predictably enough, Galton was not very appreciative of what Kandal was trying to do, and he was very determined to get more credibility for his side of the issue, and this caused him to develop survey methods and twin studies. Galton was really the first person to utilize either of those things, and they're still in use today. Galton took his survey method and distributed questionnaires to 180 members in the Royal Society. The Royal Society was just a group of men uh, who were the leaders in science at that time in England. And he asked them many different questions about themselves. But among those questions, he asked them how early they were interested in science and whether or not that interest appeared innate to them. Not surprisingly, he received information to back up his theory the same with twin studies, too. It was actually super impressive how Galton would find the evidence that he was actually looking for and would tend to ignore anything that was contrary to that. It was around this time where Galton created the term eugenics. That word comes from the Greek eu, which means good or well, in genos, meaning stock. The term eugenics means well-born. Simply stated, eugenics is a focus of enhancing humanity through a specified breeding program. In modern society, the term eugenics has a negative connotation that carries with it the weight of the atrocities that were perpetrated in its name, and deservedly so. Uh, here's some propaganda from... Uh, Nazi Germany in World War II that discussed their eugenics program. This is an example of negative eugenics. Negative eugenics is a desire or intent to halt the reproduction of those with real or perceived genetic defects. And these were the foundational beliefs of people such as Adolf Hitler and Margaret Sanger. Galton was a proponent for positive eugenics. He thought it was important to encourage intelligent and talented people to marry and reproduce. Eventually, this would enhance the intelligence of human beings and allow them to reach their highest potential. Galton founded the Eugenic Society, a journal on the study of eugenics, and spent the rest of his life promoting a world with a eugenic foundation. In order to accomplish his goal of a eugenic society... Galton knew that he would need to measure the intelligence of as many people as possible. This led him to create the Anthropometric Laboratory. It was here where he took basic physical measurements as well as sensory and motor measurements. Galton argued that intelligence was tied to neural efficiency and sensory ability. Once again, unfortunately, Galton managed to be way off base while pioneering an important issue. He argued that women were intellectually inferior to men, citing that they didn't hold any profession where sharp senses were required. It didn't occur to Galton that women were not in those professions simply because they were not afforded the opportunity, education, or sadly permission 
to acquire them. Sir Francis Galton was an exceptionally intelligent man. He pioneered methods and ideas that would change the world for the better. Psychology would not be what it has become today without the contributions that he made to it. He took the idea of natural selection and survival of the fittest and was the first person to apply that idea to human intelligence. While he may not be the first person credited to use the phrase nature versus nurture, he can be credited with bringing it to the forefront of the scientific field and forcing people into a debate over the issue. I think it would be a travesty to only look at the mistakes that he made, and yes, he did make some. But when we look at the big picture of everything he did, I think it's an understatement to say the man was an impressive individual. And these are my references. Thanks. You guys have been a fantastic audience.